Okay, today actually we are going to talk a little bit about uh, Perceptron, which is the building block of neural network, and then uh, we will talk about backpropagation, which is the main uh, optimization algorithm for any neural network that we are using now. So Perceptron, I briefly introduced what Perceptron is in the uh, previous lecture. Um, and there was a good question that does it uh, mimic exactly the biological neurons? And the answer was no. But there are some attempts to mimic the biological uh, neuron. But those that are more similar to biological neurons don't work as good as this one. But it's ongoing research. Uh, that would be a good topic for you all as well to, to think about it. If we change this built-in block of neural network, something more similar to biological neurons, can we have better generation of neural networks or not? <clears throat> but the perceptron that we have at the moment is uh, quite simple. It is basically a weighted sum of inputs. So if, if I have x, and if x comes from Rd, so with this I mean it's a vector. Every time that I put this, I mean it's a vector. So <clears throat> basically x is x1 to xd. If, uh, if I have d-dimensional vector as the input of this perceptron, so the input would be d measurements going to the perceptron, I may have intercept x0, which is 1. Then <clears throat> you can think of perceptron as having two parts. The first part is basically the weighted sum of these inputs. So if I show the weights by beta 1 to beta d, then this is going to be beta i xi for i equal 1 to d plus this beta naught. Okay? And then a nonlinear function will be applied to this. And this nonlinear function traditionally is a step function. So x comes from Rd, but y comes from a finite set, negative 1 plus 1. And the task is classification. We want to classify points in two classes. And one class, the label of one class is negative 1. The label of the other class is positive 1. Okay. So I can define a vector beta to be beta 1 to beta d. And then I can write this equation in the matrix form or vector form. So it's beta transpose x plus beta null. So we compute beta transpose x plus beta null. And this beta transpose x plus beta null depends on the value of x is going to be either positive or negative. And then I apply a step function on it. And if it's negative, it returns negative 1. And if it's positive, it returns plus 1. So it returns the label of the class. That's the goal. So we would like to learn beta in a way that it does the job that we have in hand. You know, I want to classify between elephants and zebra, and they have training set. Some of them are elephants, some of them are zebra, and I know the labels. I would like to find betas in a way that the output is correct. Whenever it's elephant, it's plus one. When it's negative, uh, zebra, it's negative one. Okay? So that's the task. <clears throat> so when Perceptron was invented. They didn't know how to set the weights correctly. You know, that was something that in optimization they find out later. Okay, so let's 
look at, you know, this is a hyperplane in d-dimensional space, right? So let's look at the geometry of this hyperplane a little bit and look at the, some, some properties of this hyperplane, which is going to be handy when we want to see how we can uh, learn perceptron. So if this is hyperplane beta transpose x plus beta null, anything in this hyperplane, any x in this hyperplane satisfy this equation equal to zero. So if I choose uh, two points, x1 and x2, any two points on this hyperplane, I can say that since they're on the hyperplane, they satisfy this equation, right? So basically, I can say beta transpose x1 plus beta null is equal to zero and beta transpose x2 plus beta null is equal to zero. It's quite hot, isn't it? Yeah, I, I left a note for uh, plant operation. They said we fixed it, but apparently they didn't. Okay, so these two points satisfy the equation and it's equal to zero. So I can say beta transpose x1 minus x2 is equal to zero, right? And beta is a vector, and x1 and x2 are vectors, so x1 minus x2 is a vector. So what do you conclude from this? We have two vectors, and that product of these two vectors is equal to zero. Yes? They are orthogonal. They are orthogonal, right? So I can conclude that beta is orthogonal to x1 minus x2. Means this is beta. Okay? So that's the first property. Second, if I choose any point, any point x null for any x null on the hyperplane, I can say beta transpose x null plus beta null is equal to zero. So I can say that beta null is equal to beta transpose negative, beta transpose x null. So beta null is equal to negative beta transpose x null for any x null on the hyperplane, right? Okay. Suppose that I have a point x, and this point x is not on the hyperplane. And I'm interested in knowing the distance of this point to the hyperplane. How can I compute this distance? Yes. Uh, explain more. Okay. How can I find the shortest distance? Find the lines of the vector drop product of that vector with the hyperplane vector zero. Okay. Right. Okay, you know, I can choose a point on the hyperplane, any point, like x null. It is trivial to find the distance between x and x null, right? And then I can project it on the direction of beta. So this is beta, which is orthogonal. If I project this on this direction, this is going to be the distance, right? So the distance between x and x null is just x minus x null. And then I have to project it in the direction of beta. So beta transpose x 
minus x null would be the distance of x to the hyperplane for any, when x null would be any point on the hyperplane. I assume beta is normalized here, you know. I assume that the length of beta is one. If it's not, you have to normalize. You have to divide it by the norm of beta. So this is going to be beta transpose x minus beta transpose x null and minus beta transpose x null for any x null on the hyperplane is beta null. So this is beta transpose x plus beta null. So basically, if you have a point and you want to know the distance of that point to the hyperplane, simply put that point in the equation of the hyperplane and it gives you the distance, right? It gives you basically signed distance, not distance. I mean, distance should be positive all the time, right? But here, if you are on one side of the hyperplane, beta transpose x plus beta null would be positive number. If you are on the other side of the hyperplane, beta transpose x plus beta null is going to be negative number. And uh, for any point on the hyperplane, it's going to be zero. So if I want the distance, not sine distance, the real distance, <coughs> I need to make it always positive. How can I make it positive? I can take absolute value, for example, but I won't take absolute value because later on I want to work with this, take derivative, and it's going to be problematic. Hmm? Square it. Square it. Square is not distance anymore. It's oh, okay. distance is squared, distance. right? So I, I can do something pretty simple. On one side, you know, Say everything on this side is positive. Any xi on this side is make this equation positive. Corresponding label to xi means yi corresponding to xi is plus one. Okay? Because my my data comes in this form. Xi yi when xi is from rd and yi is either negative or positive, okay? So yi corresponding to those points that are on the positive side are plus one. Yi's corresponding to points on the other side of the hyperplane are negative one, right? So if I simply multiply yi to beta transpose, um, xi plus beta null, this is going to be always positive, right? If it's positive, this is 1. If it's a negative, it's going to be negative 1. So it's always positive. So it's always the distance. Let's call the distance di. So that was sine distance. This is distance. Any questions so far? Okay, now I have given a data set. So I have n points of this form. Using this n points, I have given some elephants with plus one and some zebras with negative one. In total, I have n of them, and using them, I want to find the correct beta. I need to define a cost function. Remember, you know, all the steps that we had in uh, any algorithm for machine learning. We had a hypothesis class, and then we have a scoring function, and the scoring function was uh, a cost function, right? Who is better among all possible? So. With different beta, I can define different outputs. Which one is better? Which, which beta, which set of beta I prefer? 
So I can say, I would say I prefer the set of betas that the number of points that are misclassified are minimum. So I can define my error function, which is a function of beta and beta null, to be the number of points that have been misclassified. Okay, so it could be the number of points that are misclassified. But this is going to be problematic if I define it this way. You know, the, the, the only device, the only tool that we have in optimization or the main tool that we have in optimization is derivative. Whenever you define a cost function, scoring function, you have to make sure that you can take derivative. If I define it this way, I can, right? It's discrete. The number of points that are misclassified, I cannot take derivative of that. So it's a bad thing. Okay. So I can come up with another cost function. It could be many different things, right? But that's the, traditionally what they define. So the error would be summation of distance of points that have been misclassified. Not the number of points. Distance of points that have been misclassified. If 10 points are misclassified, just summation of distance of those points from the hyperplane. So this could be summation of di, and basically summation of di is summation of yi times beta transpose xi plus beta null. For all i that are in m, and M is set of all points that have been misclassified. Okay, that's the uh, summation of distance that are misclassified. Actually, not quite. I have to put a negative sign here. Do you know why? Why should I put a negative sign here? Sorry? No, that, that was correct. That was beta transfer, not minus beta. Like I, because you're not going to add the error, you want to minimize it. So you're subtracting the amount that you were off by. No, actually, I want, you know, if, say, this is my hyperplane, and uh, suppose that these are positive points and these are negative points. And if a point is misclassified, you know, suppose that this point is misclassified. So it's supposed to be on this side of the hyperplane, but it appears on the other side of the hyperplane by mistake. I have to compute the distance of this from hyperplane, and I have to do it for every point. So, you know, there is a plus that has been appeared here by mistake, and I have to compute d corresponding to this one. And then I have to add them up. Yes? You want the total number of errors to be positive number, and why should I put a negative sign here to make it a positive number? Hmm? This is going to be negative because this point has been misclassified, right? So this is the distance. If points appeared correctly, you know, any points on this side have label corresponding to its true value, you know. The value is positive and they are corresponding um, label is positive one. 
these values are negative and their corresponding label is negative. But when a point is misclassified, the value on this side is positive. But the corresponding label is negative. You know, we have a wrong label for this, a wrong value for this. So yi plus beta transpose x plus beta null for points that are misclassified is negative because the label does not match the value. So I have to put a negative sign here to make it positive. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so that's my error. And how can I optimize for beta? And the simplest thing that I can do is gradient descent, for example. And gradient descent basically means that uh, you have you know a, a, an objective function you know that's a landscape and you're somewhere this is the value of your error and you take the derivative of this error the derivative of this error will tell you the direction towards the minimum and you take one step and then you take the derivative again and take one more step and so on and so forth until you reach the minimum and if it's non-convex most likely you won't reach the global mean you're gonna get stuck in one of the local means here okay but the, the procedure is that nu beta basically would be old beta minus a step size toward the direction which goes to the minimum and this direction can be determined by derivative. So if I take derivative with respect to beta, I have to take a step. And this step could be a long step or it could be a short step, which will be determined by this row, and this row is called learning rate. And even with modern neural network, you know, you have to, this is a, one of the hyperparameters that you have to adjust, which is my learning rate. If lambda is large, you know, you take longer steps. If lambda is small, you take shorter steps. Is it better to take shorter step or long step? Depends on what? Distance from the minimum, okay? And if you're far from minimum, big step. biggest step. And if you're close to the minimum, no. yes. Yeah, it depends, you know, and there are techniques to adjust it accordingly, depends on how far you are from the mean. Uh, if you're far, it's good to take long steps and approach the minimum quickly. But if you're close to the minimum, it could be problematic to take longer steps. Suppose that I'm here and I don't take a short step, I take a long step and longer step will does not lead to this point. Take me to this point, for example. And then I take another longer step, I get back here and then it will oscillate between two points that are not minimum. You know, I will not reach the minimum. Okay, so I can do the same thing for beta null, right? Uh, so beta null nu would be beta null old minus rho derivative of error with respect to beta null. So I need to take derivative of error with respect to beta, 
And what would be the derivative of this error with respect to beta? You know, the first term is yi beta transpose xi. If I take derivative with respect to beta. Sorry? What? yi xi. You know, this term is, you know, I have yi beta transpose xi plus, actually, in this negative. negative yi beta null. If I take derivative with respect to beta of this, it's just yi xi, right? So it is yi xi negative, and there's a summation here, actually. And if I take derivative of error with respect to Beta, no, I mean, for beta, when you take derivative with respect to beta, this is going to be zero, right? If I take derivative with respect to beta null, this is going to be zero. And what's about this one? Just minus yi, right? So this is going to be minus yi for i equal to m. So, uh, yes? Why, like at the very beginning, why are we assuming that the first input is a 1? Like, why is it not x0? And why are we doing it? This one? This is for, uh, like, intercept. I want to add a constant to my linear function. And I put it 1. Then beta null times 1 is going to be beta null. Right? I don't want my function to be in the form of beta transpose x. I want to be beta transpose x plus a constant. And this will take care of the constant. But you can do it without. Sorry? You can still do it without having constant. You can do it without having the constant, but it doesn't have the intercept, right? If uh, you want a linear function of this form, you need this beta null. <clears throat> okay, so a simple algorithm would be like beta beta null is equal in, equal to beta, beta null, so that's new, this is old, minus rho, it's going to be sigma, negative sigma yi xi, and this is negative yi, so I just put a plus here, so it is sigma yi xi, this is sigma yi It's going to be gradient descent algorithm, which leads to uh, a local mean. In practice, usually we do this. This is not exactly gradient descent, but this is one form of stochastic gradient descent. It's easier in practice because otherwise for each iteration you have to calculate all points that have been misclassified, sum them up. But in this case you just do it for one point. We will learn about stochastic gradient descent and we'll see why it works in practice. Okay. So you have a perceptor and you want to learn. You have a set of data point xi, xj from i will call 1 to n. Some of them are elephants, some of them are zebras. You want to find the right beta. Just initialize your perceptron with some random beta. Put one point inside, you know, it's elephant, for example. And the output is plus one, so I'm fine. 
the next point is elephant, but the output is negative one. So I have to adjust my bait. I started with some random bait. I have to adjust it. How can I adjust it? Those random bait that I have chosen, I sum it with some row that I have choose as learning rate times the label of this point, which is positive one, the point itself, and the label. So I have a new set of bait. Third point, fourth point, up to the last point. So you continue this process until it converges. <coughs> converges means that there is no significant difference between beta old and beta new. It doesn't change anymore. So it means that I reached here, local mean, and the derivative is like this. It doesn't change the beta. And I'm done. That's first step. Any question? Okay. Okay, some properties of perceptron, if the data is linearly separable, uh, first of all, with perceptron, you can only classify two class, not more at the time. So if the data is linearly separable, then you can show that this algorithm will converge eventually with the finite number of iterations, okay? Uh, the number of iteration depends on learning rate and uh, the gap. If the two cloud of data that you have are pretty close, that it's linearly separable, they're very close. It takes more time. If it's well separated, it takes less. It also depends on lear learning rate. Uh, I told you that it can do only two classes. Uh, convergence to a solution is guaranteed when the data is linearly separable. But it depends, I mean, it's not unique. When the data is, you know, you have this data, it is linearly separable. Then, you start with some beta and you get this solution. You start with another set of beta and you get this solution. So there are infinitely many solutions and depends on the beta, you get to a solution. It's not unique. If data is not linearly separable, a negative for example is here, then it will not convert. Okay. Uh, I told you about large learning rate and small learning rate. Uh, when I say linearly separable or nonlinearly separable, what do I mean mathematically? You know, if data is linearly separable, <coughs> like this one, it means that yi plus beta transpose xi plus beta null is greater than equal some gamma for any i. Means that the distance to the hyperplane is always greater than some positive number. So this means that the, the data is linearly separable. Okay. 
So we are done with perceptron and we are going to start talking about fit forward neural network and back propagation. But before I do so, let me know if you have any questions. Yes. Sorry, for the condition of separability, why particularly gamma is it's ambiguous? I mean, it's not, it's always not take zero or or is there any constraint particularly about that gamma? Because we would like to measure the degree of separability, you can say it's greater than zero, means that they're on the two different side. Yes. But the, the value of gamma tell me that they are well separated or they are not well separated. You know, if gamma is large, means they are well, well separated. If gamma is quite small, if the largest, if the largest gamma that they can compute is a small, means they are not. They are pretty close. The gap is close. So it plays role in the theorem that we prove for uh, perceptron, which has the role of gap. Okay, so the first and the, the, the most simplest neural network that was introduced after, you know, knowing about perceptron and how to uh, optimize perceptron was fit forward neural network. I mentioned when I talked about the history of neural network that perceptron originally, you know, they had a big dream that they solve AI and, you know, it's going to work, it's going to write, it's going to do everything, and uh, uh, also they believe that it's going to be conscious about its existence soon. But a book called Perceptron was published in 1960, which shattered the dream, and they showed that it's a linear function. You know, we know that it's a linear function. They didn't know that. You know, when, when they invented it, they didn't know that. It's just a linear function. And the, the main message of that book was that if you have XOR data, you can't do it with perceptron. So it's not as strong as we assume. So one idea to get around it was to put some perceptrons together. <coughs> so make layers of perceptron and then connect them. Uh, and this is called basically fit forward uh, neural network. So in fit forward neural network, we have input layer, we have some hidden layers, and we have output layer, okay? You can uh, basically explain neural network in terms of, uh, I mean, fit forward neural network with, with matrix notations. You know, if I have input, say for example, a three dimensional input, x1, x2, and x3, and it goes to a five dimension, then define all of these weights as a three by five matrix. And then this is going to be uh, U1 transpose X. X was 3 by 1. And U was 3 by 5. So U1 transpose is 5 by 3. So the output is going to be 5 by 1. So this is going to be output. Right? And the same thing here. For U2 is 5 by 4. If I multiply this by U2 transpose, which is 4 by 5, it's going to give me this values. And then U3, which is 4 by 2, it's going to give me 2 by 4. So I can explain it in matrix form. But if I do it this way, just U3, U3 times U2 times U1 is going to be just a one matrix, right? It's going to be two by uh, f 
two by three matrix. And it's just a linear operation. So perceptron is linear, this is gonna be linear as well, right? So if I want to make it nonlinear, I have to apply a nonlinearity here, the activation function. You know, when I multiply this matrix to this, then I have to apply a nonlinearity, you know. And we had this nonlinearity in perceptron. You know, perceptron was a linear sum. Then we had a nonlinearity, which, I mean, traditionally was a step function. But in modern neural network, it could be many different forms. Okay? So we have to apply a nonlinearity and then apply U2 and then apply a nonlinearity and then apply U3 then apply a nonlinearity. So these step, these um, uh, activation functions make the process nonlinear, and highly nonlinear. If you don't have it, if you don't have this part, then it's going to be linear, right? So this is feedforward neural network, and we had perceptron, which was linear. Through this process, we make it nonlinear, and we hope that we can solve more complicated problems. We are not able to do X or with uh, perceptron because it was linear. Let's have a nonlinear function, see if we can do, say, for example, perceptron or not. Okay, so we can take all of the steps that we took before, means that all the steps that we take in uh, machine learning, like our hypothesis class was perceptron. We changed our hypothesis class to a more complicated hypothesis class, class of fit forward neural networks. Then we have to come up with a scoring function, some, some cost function, how to measure the error, or how we prefer one set of weights to other weights. And then we have a, need a search strategy to find these weights. But don't forget that the tool that we have is uh, derivative. Right? And I should be able, you know, say I define a very simple cost function. I say that the cost function is true value minus estimated value squared. I need to be able to take derivative of this with respect to any weights here. And this is not a trivial job, you know. It was trivial for perceptron, but it's not trivial in this setting, you know. I have an output here, and I would like to know if I perturb this weight, what's going to happen here? If I perturb this weight, many things will change along the way. You know, this will change, and this change all of them, and they have another layer, it will change others. So it's not trivial to find <coughs> the derivative of this cost function with respect to a weight, and backpropagation is an algorithm actually to calculate this uh, <coughs> derivatives, which we are going to learn about now. Backpropagation, as I told you before, has been invented several times in the history of machine learning. And the main idea is using chain rule to chain rule and recursion to compute uh, a derivative. Okay. Okay, back propagation. <clears throat> okay, assume that you have a neural network, a feed forward neural network, and it has many layers. I just take a snapshot of three layers of this neural network. And this is one node in layer, in one layer. And there are many nodes here. And there are layers before that, and there are layers after that. So suppose that this layer is layer L. 
and I call this layer I and I call this layer J and there are layers before and there are layers after okay and there are weights which connect these nodes together. Let's call this the weight of this node uij, and let's call this uji. <coughs> These nodes are perceptron, and they have two parts. A part which is weighted sum of inputs, and then a nonlinear function will apply to this and becomes the output. I call the first part A, which is a weighted sum of inputs. And I call the output part Z after you apply the nonlinear function to A. Okay? So that's going to be AI ZI, and this is going to be AJ ZJ. <coughs> And then I have some layers, and at the end, I want to measure the distance between the true value and estimated value. And now my job is to find the derivative of y minus y hat. This is y minus y hat, just an example. It could be any cost function. I want to find the derivative of y minus y hat with respect to, say, for example, this weight. <coughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, U J I. This is U I L. Thank you. Thanks that you made this correction. Otherwise, you know, we start with U I J, and everything will be messed up. Okay. Um, be careful with my math. You know, I make many of this type of mistakes. <clears throat> I was a very bad student in elementary school in math because of this. Uh, okay. Um, we would like to find the derivative of the output with respect to this weight, right? I can apply a chain rule. I can write it, this derivative to be derivative with respect to AI, which is directly connected to this weight. And derivative of AI with respect to UIL. Okay, what's derivative of output with respect to AI? I don't know, it's still a complicated quantity, you know, because when I perturb AI, many things will perturb along the way. So I don't know this quantity, I just call it delta I. Delta I is unknown to me. What about this one? Derivative of AI with respect to IL. Sorry? It is ZL. Why it is ZL? Because this AI, when I write here, can you see it? It doesn't, no? Uh, okay, I, I write it here. You know, AI is summation of all of ZLs, right? It's a summation 
of u i l times z l for all nodes on l, right? Now I take derivative of a i with respect to u i l. It's going to be z l, right? I take derivative, you know, it's a sum. And I take derivative with respect to one of the elements. Everything else would be zero. And it's going to be just ZL. So this is pretty important. The derivative of the cost function with respect to UIL is <coughs> delta I. times <clears throat> Z L. Okay. Z L is noun. You can compute. But delta I is not. So I have to do something about this delta I. And delta I is derivative of the cost. with respect to AI. Okay. Let's apply chain rule one more time. I can write it as derivative of Y minus Y hat. You know, I want the derivative of the cost with respect to AI. Let's write it with respect to AJ. Okay, so th there's a quantity delta i for this layer, which is unknown. Let's rewrite it in terms of the same quantity for the next layer. So you can get the sense that what I'm planning to do, you know, I want to write some sort of recursive function such that this, you know, because when I perturb this, something happened here, something happened here, something happened here, and I want to write the, the uh, I mean, this quantity in terms of this layer, in terms of this layer, in terms of the next layer. <clears throat> so I write it with respect to AJ, and then AJ with respect to AI. Just apply chain. There's something wrong here, you know, I have to do something to make it cracked. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, no. The nonlinearity will be implicitly, you know, embedded somewhere because AJ and AI, you know, goes through ZAI, which is nonlinear form of AI. You know, when I perturb AI, you know, did, what, what this derivative tell me? It tell me if I perturb AI, how does this will change? And I say, okay, if you perturb AI, you can write it as how much AJ will be perturbed. And then the effect of uh, basically uh, other factors. But when I perturb AI, there are many points here, many nodes here. All of them will be perturbed, not just this one, right? So every single one will be perturbed. So I have to basically, you know, count all of them. So this is going to be summation over all J's. Because when you perturb AI, all of these nodes will change. Is that clear? OK. Uh, so summation over all j's of <clears throat> derivative of cost with respect to j. 
So derivative of cos with respect to i, I call it delta i. So it, I call it delta g. So I can manage to write delta i with, in terms of delta g, you know. This unknown quantity for this layer, I'm trying to rewrite it in terms of the unknown quantity of this layer. So this is delta j. What about this one? So I'm going to apply chain rule one more time. Aj with respect to Ai. I write it Aj with respect to Zi. And then Zi with respect to Ai. What is Aj with respect to Zi? Just Uji. So this is Uji. What is Zi with respect to Ai? Sorry? Derivative of the activation function because Zi is simply, you know, Zi is just some activation function Ai. And derivative of Zi with respect to Ai is just derivative of this activation function. So derivative of this activation function at point Ai. So delta I would be sigma over J of lambda j times u j i times derivative of activation function at point a i. And I can take this out of this summation because it's, it doesn't depend on j. So I managed to write this unknown quantity for layer I in terms of the same quantity for layer J because these two are known. So with the same token, I can compute delta J based on the next layer. And lambda of uh, and delta of the next layer based on the layer after and the layer after and the layer after, right? Up to the last layer. Up to the last layer. Whatever the last layer is, you know, I'm going to add one more layer to it. And this layer is pretty. simple layer. Suppose that this is uh, layer K. And AK is just identity. Whatever comes in goes out. You know, no matter how many layers you have, you always can, you know, have add a layer to it such that it's just identity. Whatever comes in goes out. Yes. Delta, delta Z over delta A, and then times. Sorry, here? Lower, yeah, and then at the right. Okay. So delta Z I over delta A times here. And that's the same thing as the next term? No? Yes, yes, sir.
Yeah, I warned you. <coughs> Thank you. OK. Uh, so no, many, no matter how many layers do you have, you always can add a layer to your neural network such that its identity, whatever comes in, goes out. And suppose that I will call it K, layer K. So what would be delta K? Delta K, by definition, is derivative of the cost with respect to A K. Right? And uh, I can write it as derivative of this with respect to y hat, you know, and then I can say it's like 2y minus y hat. So basically, I can always compute the, 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 this quantity for the last layer, you know. And it's quite intuitive, you know, the difficulty of this quantity was that when I perturb something here, many things along the way will change up to get to the cost function. But that's not the case for the last layer. For the last layer where you perturb something, it has only effect on the uh, cost function. So basically, always you can compute this quantity for the last layer. Now, we have a recursive function such that delta i depends on delta j. And it depends on the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer, up to the last layer. And I can compute delta k for when k is the last layer. So recursively, I can compute delta k for the last layer, and then compute delta for the layer before that, and the delta for the layer before that. And I can compute this delta for all layers. And if I have delta for all layers, then I can compute the derivative of the cost with respect to any weight, right? Because for any weight I L, it depends on delta I, which I have it for all layers, and Z L, which I have it. Okay, so basically the back propagation procedure will work like this. You know, again, I have N data points. I have n data points, and I feed the first data to the network. I set all weights to be random. All weights are random. I feed the first point. I can calculate all of A's. I can calculate all of Z's, because these I, I set some uh, random weights. And it's going to have an output, and I have a true value. I can calculate the cost, right? Uh, I can calculate the delta for the last layer, the delta for the previous layer up to the first layer. Having all of this delta, I can compute this quantity. Knowing this quantity for any weight, for any weight u i l, I can update the old weight by taking one step toward the derivative. And so I have a better weight now. Now I can apply the second data point and the third data point and the fourth data point until to the last data point. And this is called one epoch. And then we start over. We feed all of these points one more time, one more time. And you need many epochs usually until it converges. <clears throat> okay. Any question? Yes. Uh, 
No. No, I mean, you you have one point, and based on this one point, you make some correction on your weight. Second, third, fourth, fifth, up to the last, right? This is one epoch. You go over all points again, and in practice, you know, you just do some randomization. You don't go in the same order. Usually, you change the order for some optimization reason, up to the point that it converges. Converges means it doesn't change anymore. Means you reached a local mean. These derivatives does not do anything. You know, they don't change uh, the point. Uh, so the error rate on training set now is small. It correctly. Uh, or almost correctly classify points in your data set or do regression in your training set. Does it generalize well? Means if you show a new point, it works well. That's the question of generalization that would be you know, the topic of next lecture. That when a model generalizes well, under which condition? Right. If we pass another uh, uh, training data point only, okay. during that time, uh, the, the weight for the first uh, data point is updated now again with respect to the second data error. Mm -hmm. So now, that weight, whatever you update in the first data point, that will be different when compared to second data. Yes. So when we do this linear uh, uh, more, modeling of, like when we uh, multiply the weight with I think if I can uh, rephrase your question, I believe your question is that, okay, I adjust the weight with respect to the first point, and I have a different point now. And I adjust, I adjust the point with respect to the second point. How should I know that my adjustment with respect to this point do something good for maybe it just ruined the previous one, right? Yes. Um, if the capacity of your model is not large enough, you know, if your model is not able to classify all of these points at the same time, this is going to happen. I mean, you adjust for this one, and when you want to adjust for this one, you ruin the first one, you know. But with the assumption that it has enough capacity to classify all of them at the same time, then the assumption, our assumption, is that there is a set of weights which is good for all of these endpoints, for all of them, right? And then in this <clears throat> regime, going through many epochs will help us to reach to that point. You are correct that the second point may be ruined the first one a little bit, but in the long run, stochastically, if the model is large enough, I mean the capacity of the model is large enough, then the hope is that eventually you're going to reach a set of points that's good for everyone. But in each iteration, it's possible that, you know, say for example, you, you do it for x1, and it's possible that when you feed x2, it's not as good as it was for x1 before this change. But stochastically and eventually, it's going to be an optimal for everyone. If you are, want to have a set of weights which is optimal for one of them, you're going to have a better weights. You know? It's correct that you ruin them a little bit. But 
it's collectively the best, not individually the best. <clears throat> okay, these are slides for back propagation. Just uh, I wanted to summarize back propagation as I explained. Uh, you're going to apply X to fit forward neural network and then propagate through all of this layer. Uh, this is called forward pass. In forward pass, you calculate all of these A's and Z's. And then uh, this X reaches the output. You can compute the uh, derivative of the last, I mean the lambda K, the delta K of the last layer. This is And then you can update based on gradient descent for all weights, find set of new weights. This is called epoch, as you told you, when you go through all of these endpoints, this one epoch, and then usually you go through many of them. There are some uh, practical tips in uh, many of them actually will be we will discuss them later on, you know, and introduce different models. But something simple here, one is that in different epochs, try to randomize the points, you know, when you start from X1 to Xn, in the next epoch, don't start from Xn to Xn. It's better to just shuffle them. The other thing is that the starting points, when you initialize, it's better to initialize with uh, weights close to zero, small weights, not large weights. Sorry? Uh, not necessarily, you know, when it's in gradient doesn't have to, the, the value of this weight at the beginning, but the, the reason that we start with this new weights. Actually, the reason can be more clear when we talk about regularization in the next lecture, lecture after that. But uh, very uh, intuitively, if you want to think about this activation functions, uh, have sort of linear behavior close to zero. And they become highly nonlinear when you are far from zero. One of the reasons that we start with weights close to zero is that the whole model is similar to a linear model now because we are in this regime. And at the beginning, as if you are optimizing a linear model, it's quite easier in terms of optimization to start with something completely nonlinear, you know, behavior, then it, it makes the problem hard. It's just a, a practical issue, not theoretical. Any question? Yes. When we have a nonlinear model, what's your question now? Are there techniques that you can use to make the weight adjustments um, more local to the area you're concerned about? What is, why it's a good practice? Why should I do that in terms of optimization? We want it to, we don't know which area we want it to, you know. We don't know what are the correct answer. We don't know where the weight's supposed to be. You know, even in this case, maybe the correct weight is right here. It's quite large. 
we just initialize it with small values to control the behavior of the model at the beginning, make it more linear, and uh, control it in a way it doesn't have subtle changes at the beginning, you know, until it gets somewhere which is closer to the weights that it's supposed to be. So we have no idea of the true value of the weights to be close to that area. You know, we start from here, but maybe the true value is quite far from it. So we, we can't actually restrict the model or restrict the optimization to be in the locality of the existing weight. But if you want to do that, this can be done by learning rate. Small learning rate makes sure that we are in the locality of that weight that we just learned. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>